And, and for a long time, the uh, ice-free corridor idea was the I, dominant idea as to how uh, non-glaciated North America down here became populated with humans. And it was presumed that these people that came down through this would have been the Clovis. And, and of course, this is connected with one of the, the, the dominant themes of what we're going to be talking about here in the next few minutes and we're talking about last week was the mechanism by which the megafaunal uh the animals the great megafaunal animals went extinct and of course the dominant idea up to this point has been that they were hunted to extinction by paleo indian uh immigrants who came over the bering land bridge uh came down through the ice free door free corridor presumably slaughtering every mega mammal that they encountered in their, not only the, the, the woolly mammoths, but three other species of proboscideans, the mammothus imperator, mammothus primogenius, um, the mastodons, a mammut americanum, um, and then you get all of the rest of them. You, you get the giant ground sloths, you get the, the, you get the predators, like the, the Ursus phalius, the, the cave bear, you get the Arctodus simus, the giant short-faced bear that we uh, introduced to folks last week. Um, the list goes on and on. You know, camels. You had very large camels that lived in North America during the Ice Age that stood Crazy. up to seven or eight feet at the shoulders. Wow. Um, amazing uh, species of camel that, that's now, of course, extinct. And, of course, it, we saw last week that a number of, of paleontologists looking at this incredible fauna, diverse fauna that inhabited North America, said the only modern comparison is it would be like the Serengeti plain of Africa, right? But yet you look there and you've only got one species of, of elephant, you know, in North America, we basically had four species. So, you know, it, it's amazing. And people do not really have the picture of, of that world. So that's part of what I think our objective here would be over this and maybe a couple more podcasts is to, to try to recreate a picture of that world. And it may not be 100% accurate in every detail, obviously, but I think at this point we have enough data and enough information that we can reconstruct uh, in, 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 in pretty accurate detail what that world was like. Um, and, and I think that's important to understand how, uh, to understand that world in order to understand how it disappeared and how we get from that world to this world that saw the rise of civilization, you know, the, the, when we go back to the first millennium or two or three coming out of the ice age, we find the beginnings of agriculture. We find dispersal of languages. We find uh, domestication of animals. We find the first urban complexes. So why is it that you had humans, modern humans with presumably similar intelligence to our own based upon skeletal remains that would suggest that their cranial capacity was was every bit as as comparable to our own yet for 150 to 200,000 years there was no accumulated knowledge that could be uh could lead to what we would think of as civilization you know why and and how is it that you could have when when we look at how rapidly uh human population has grown over the past couple of centuries. Once we got the, 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 the black plague and, the, and the, the famines and things out of the way, which were a consequence of a deteriorating climate, mostly cold and damp, once we got those things out of the way, notice in the last couple of hundred years how exponentially population has, has taken off, population numbers. How is it that for all of those thousands and thousands of years, all of those millennia, Population remained relatively stable at pro perhaps a few million to 10 million individuals worldwide. To me, that's a mystery. What was it? What was qualitatively different about the present that has allowed this rapid expansion of human population? And yet for 150 or 200,000 years, that never happened. Did it happen? So we don't know. When, what was the population? We know from scarce and very sparse, widely dispersed skeletal remains that modern humans were inhabiting the planet 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago. But it never seemed that they went beyond uh, apparently a few million individuals. If they did, 
if, if they had reached the levels comparable to, to modern times, where you might have been talking about hundreds of millions or even a, a billion people, why would we not find more traces of their having existed? And could the population have reached hundreds of millions, given the, the nomadic nature of the lifestyles, the hunter-gatherer lifestyles, perhaps global climatic conditions during the Ice Age were not conducive to the establishment of civilization. What is the fundamental thing, shiny brothers, that you need to have to build a civilization? What is, what is the, the, the foundation of it? What do you think? I would say oh. agriculture. Exactly, agriculture. You, you got to have agriculture. That's the first thing. So is it possible that during the Ice Age, agriculture was extremely difficult, if not yes. impossible? Yeah, I think that's possible. We should look in, at that. In some places, it might have been easy. You know, yes. I don't know. And I think that's the whole point. One of the th ideas we've been emphasizing through this series is that, yeah, maybe there were places where, because of the, the unique circumstances, were more benign, would have been um, susceptible to uh, the growth of something that we might think of civilization. When we talk about the Minoans or the Phoenicians, we're not talking about, you know, SUVs and, and, and you know, intercontinental airplane flights or or any of that we're not talking about televisions or cell phones we're talking about a maritime culture right Who, who's uh, in its own way is sophisticated but not to the level that we are today technologically but we still call them uh, a civilization we would talk um legitimately about the minoan civilization so and i shouldn't have said it it would it would be easy because farming is never easy it's never easy <laughs> that's right as a farmer, I can say it is not easy, <laughs> even with all the equipment we have nowadays. So, right, uh, and grow, growing up in rural Minnesota, yeah, I mean that's I know that for a fact. Yeah, I mean I worked on farms for four years during my teenage years, so and I know how hard farm. that work can be. Yeah. yeah. So even if even if there were places that were conducive to farming, it's still not easy. Yeah. So it's you, still not easy, right? And, serious. and if we are to believe the, uh, the proxy data about carbon dioxide concentrations, we're looking at, and, and, and at, at some point we'll, we'll, we'll get into a more in-depth discussion about the carbon cycle and what, how, how it may have affected or been affected by uh, the changes in, in climate that occur between glacial and interglacial ages. But if, let's say we accept the proxy data, there, there would be times when, when um, carbon dioxide concentrations got below 200 parts per million. Yeah. And would... you know what happens then? I mean, most of, most of our food crops are uh, not going to uh, uh, require more than 200 parts per million to, to flourish. Yeah. Many and, plants are at that level, yeah. Yeah. And so when you get down to 200 parts per million, you're, you're getting really dangerously low. And which brings us to another interesting topic is that if we look at the long term, the big picture of, of Earth history, we, we see that for 95% of Earth history, carbon dioxide concentrations have been higher than now, right? Sometimes way much higher, way higher. right? If you look at it in that context, uh, and, and some of those that have been roundly, um, you know, denigrated for saying such things, but have pointed out that we're in effect in a, a, or have been in a carbon, a CO2 drought for a lot of the Holocene. And that, that 300, 200, see pre-industrial carbon dioxide is about 280 parts per million. So 80 to 100 parts per million during the ice age low. And one reason that that would be is because when the, when the planet cools off and the ocean cools, it becomes a CO2 sink and it starts sucking down all of the carbon dioxide. And, you know, then when, when there's a warming again, it outgasses the CO2. So it's almost like there could be like this self-perpetuating feedback loop that once the planet is, succumbs to an ice age, there's a lot of forces that want to keep the planet in an ice age. Not the least of which, as you look at this graphic here, look at, you've got 6 million square miles of white. Right. That's, that's reflective. That, so that, that right there substantially changes the, the planetary albedo right there. And so... You know, we're, we're, we're reflecting a lot of heat back into space. And then the fact that down the, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, then you're going to have, uh, it's going to put stress on plants. 
particularly the kind of plants that 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 would be uh, food crops. So that might be part of it. I'm not saying that we've got it all figured out and this is this is the answer to it. But I think that that's kind of the line of thinking that would be productive here to consider that perhaps climatic conditions were such during the late Pleistocene that it just was not conducive to to agriculture and and subjected the human species to this kind of hunter-gatherer existence. 